Well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm, I am humbled to be here because for 28 years, the Health Action Network Society has been achieving what I hope someday to be able to achieve, and that is uh, to save some lives. So uh, thank you so much for welcome, welcoming me within, within your midst. I appreciate it greatly. I would like to preface my remarks uh, tonight uh, with the perspective that, that I, I believe that exposure to environmental electromagnetic radiation is potentially the most significant health threat that society has ever faced. I also believe that we can fix the problem before it gets to the point of catastrophe. Now, <clears throat> the Vietnam War was uh, a very difficult time for society in a number of ways, but one of the things that came out of that was the recognition that there was a need to be able to communicate freely with mobile communication. And that provided an impetus for the birth in 1984 of the cell phone. So in 1984, the first wireless technology was introduced for widespread consumer use. Now at that time, the only information that we had about the health effects of microwave radiation had to do with heating. So that if you had a microwave exposure and it was pushed by large amounts of power, it could cause heating of tissue. And that was the mechanism that was widely accepted in the scientific and medical community for health risks. Because of that, in 1984, the cell phone industry convinced regulatory authorities, such as the Food and Drug Administration in the United States and Health Canada, that cell phones should be exempted from pre-market testing because they operated at very low power and that the power was too low to cause heating of biological tissue. And that low power exclusion resulted in cellular phone technology being introduced into society with no pre-market safety testing. Now, in 1993, a woman named Deborah Raynard passed away from a brain tumor. And her surgeon recognized that this was a rare type of brain cancer because it was a neural epithelial tumor that began on the outside of her brain and grew inward. And the place where the tumor began was the same place where the antenna from the cell phone that her husband had bought her during her pregnancy so that he could remain in contact with her because she had a very difficult pregnancy. They sued the cell phone industry saying that the brain tumor was a result of the cell phone use and they got a spot on Larry King Live. And on that program, they brought in an x-ray of her tumor. And on the television, they took a cell phone and put it on the x-ray next to where the tumor was evident. The next day, Motorola stock went down by five points. The day after that, the Cell Phone Industry Trade Association held a press conference. And in that press conference, they said, there are thousands of studies that prove that cell phones are safe and that the brain tumor could not have come from the cell phone. And of course, the media in the audience said, <clears throat> that's, uh, that's good news. 
can we see those studies? Three days later, they produced a pile of studies that were related to microwave oven exposure. So the industry had either misrepresented underlying science or told a flat out lie to the consumers. <clears throat> to say that all hell broke loose would be an understatement. Two weeks later, there were congressional hearings in the United States and experts in the, from the cell phone industry and from the medical community and the scientific community were brought in to tell Congress what the heck happened here. First thing, it was clear that the industry and the government in 1984 had made a big mistake. They exempted cell phones from pre-market testing, therefore there were no data with which to do an evaluation about the safety of the cell phone. <clears throat> the cell phone industry and the government agencies were now very odd and interesting bed partners because they both were responsible for at that time more than 15 million people in North America using cellular phones that had never been tested for safety. The cell phone industry stepped up and said, well, we're going to put a bunch of money into research, and here's the deal, government. We'll pay for the research so long as you do not regulate us until the research is done. The deal was struck. They looked for somebody to run that program. <clears throat> Back then I thought I was in the right place at the right time. Now I think I was at the wrong place at the right time. So between 1993 and 2000, I oversaw uh, a $28.5 million research and surveillance effort that was funded by the cell phone industry in Canada and the United States and was overseen by the government. And over that time, I came to Canada several times to give briefings to Health Canada, various uh, ministries of health uh, in the provinces, as well as uh, briefings to Food and Drug Administration and other regulatory authorities in the United States. Everything was fine until in 1998, we began to see the results of our longer term studies come through and one by one, they were showing us things that we never expected. Because the historical scientific mantra was no heating, no problem. Cell phones operated at low power. There could be no heating. Therefore, there should be no problem. It wasn't the case. We found that the near field radiation plume within seven or eight inches of the cell phone antenna caused leakage in the blood brain barrier. <clears throat> you see, brain tissue is highly specialized. All it does is think, it can't protect itself. So, that over evolution, we have evolved a hard skull to protect brain tissue against trauma and also. The vasculature or blood vessels of the brain have a special filtering system called the blood-brain barrier that keeps dangerous chemicals that are always circulating in your blood from reaching the sensitive brain tissue. And what we found, much to our surprise, was that the cell phone radiation in the near field opened up the blood-brain barrier so that those dangerous chemicals could make it directly to sensitive brain tissue. We also found that the near field plume from the cell phone caused the formation of micronuclei in human blood cells. Now micronuclei are pieces of DNA that form a membrane around themselves. They're not complete 
complements of DNA, but they're able to function well enough to form a membrane and live. To put this into context, after the Chernobyl nuclear power plant explosion, public health scientists and doctors from around the world converged on Chernobyl, took blood samples from the people in the neighborhood, and looked for one thing, micronuclei. And if micronuclei were found, those patients were worked up as cancer patients. So we found micronuclei in blood following the exposure to the near field. Now we also conducted a series of epidemiological studies, studies of people using cell phones. Now to put this into context, the cell phone was first introduced in 1984. In 1993, there were about 15 million people using cell phones. Uh, and through the 90s, those numbers went up to about 75 or 80 million worldwide. Cell phones had not been around very long. And historically, in public health, we knew that it took us 100 years to figure out that cigarette smokes cause lung cancer. And it took 70 years to figure out that asbestos caused mesothelioma of the lung. So we never expected to see anything in the epidemiological studies. We were doing them to establish baseline because we thought 20 years down the line, somebody was going to, be, want, going to want to be able to compare. The problem was that every study we did showed an increase in the risk of tumors, an increase in the risk of the rare neural epithelial tumors that had been the subject of the lawsuit in 1993. And in fact, the risk was a doubling to a tripling risk increase for both benign and malignant brain tumors. Now, this information was surprising to us, went back to the industry <clears throat> and to the government agencies and said, you know, we think it's a good idea for you to tell the public that some studies have been done that raise some red flags and that we're going to continue studying this. And as we learn more, we'll let you know. But in the meantime, if you want to take precautions to protect yourself, here are some things that you can do. You can use a headset. You can move the near field plume away from you. The industry and the government regulators working together, saw this as a public relations problem, not as a public health problem. And because it was a public relations problem, they thought that if you got rid of the messenger, you could get rid of the problem. And a very sophisticated program was put in place to allow the industry to distance themselves from the findings of the research that they themselves had funded. They hired people to plant stories on the internet that discredited me and the other 200 doctors and scientists who were involved in the program. Over a period of time, the criticisms were showing up in so many places that I had to write a book to answer not only those criticisms, but to make clear what actually happened. And 